Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on Return to the Office, a workforce-focused approach. For optimal viewing of today's presentations, we suggest that you switch to side-by-side -side mode by clicking on the View Options tab next to the green or Viewing Presentation tab on the top or bottom of your Zoom screen. I'm Eric Mary Bojek, the Director of the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship at the George Mason University School of Business. The center is the university's platform for real estate education and its forum for important real estate topics. The pandemic university has forced millions of workers to adapt to home-based work for an extended period. The governor of Virginia has recently announced that the first phase of returning to public spaces may begin by next week on May 15th. Companies are now beginning to think about how to reopen their workspaces. How can property owners, building managers, and companies make employees feel safe, healthy, and productive in this transitional work environment? We are joined today by two industry experts in a discussion of strategic and tactical issues for the transitional return to the office. First though, we'd like to thank the members of our center's advisory board. These are some of the leading real estate organizations in the Metro DC area, which provide us with guidance and financial support and enable us to deliver educational programs, programs like the one we have today. We have two expert speakers who are sharing their time and knowledge with us this afternoon. Our first speaker is Cynthia Miloda, the Director of Workplace Strategy of Ware Malcolm. Cynthia brings over 15 years of workplace strategy experience, delivering human-centered, experience-based work environments. She is responsible for leading her firm's workplace strategy practice, working with clients on wellness, social responsibility, talent strategy, workforce ecosystem, and measures for success. Where Malcolm is an international design firm with locations throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico, including here in Washington, DC. The firm is ranked among the top 15 architecture firms in engineering news records, top 500 design firms. I now turn the webinar over to Cynthia. Thank you, Eric. If you can stop sharing for me, thank you. Eric, please confirm that you can see my slides okay. We can see him great. We can see you fine, Cynthia. Thanks, Mike. Okay, well, um, thanks for that nice introduction. Um, I'm happy to be able to chat with you today. I'm sorry that it's not more interactive, but um, Eric promises that we'll have time at the end to um, sort of dig a little bit deeper into this. Um, into this. So it's been a great pleasure to get to meet Eric and Mike in this process. So um, I'm happy to lead us off. Uh, so perception is reality. How many times have we heard that statement? But what does that really mean in COVID? Like perception is reality it has a different meaning in this context. I don't need to remind anyone on this webinar that people are a business's most important aspect. And that's really where our design firm's research um, interests lie, more in about the people part. Um, we conducted a research study earlier this COVID-19 work from home uh, period. And uh, we framed the research in self-determination theory. Now I'm sure like hearkening back to undergraduate psychology, you all remember self-determination theory. Um, it's, it's a sort of underpinning of human behavior research. And it has three main components to it and I'll refresh your memory. So autonomy, which is how one wants to control their own actions 
competence, which means you want to be skilled at something, and relatedness, which is our feeling of social connection. So we set out to explore how those three things were impacting people as they were working from home. How are they maintaining their social connections? How was engagement going? And then really more importantly, speculate on these implications from working from home and what it was going to be like when folks eventually, at some point, to some degree, return to the office. So our methodology, uh, we conducted this study the first um, April 1st through April 3rd. We had 12 respondents, all from Fortune 500s, and them, our research uh, technique was structured interviews. So I'm going to go over a couple of the couple of our findings. So, not surprisingly, um, trust was the most important aspect that came up in this research. And as you know, applied psychology research really shows that trust is a, is essential between colleagues and their organizations to make sure and it's really crucial for achieving. Um, organizational and corporate performance. Our study showed ample trust between the employees and the organization. Interestingly, even without middle managers looking over everyone's shoulder digitally. Um, there, I'm sure we've heard that old paradigm, you know, if I can't see them, I don't know that they're working. Well, I mean, that's yesterday's news. That has certainly been shattered by all of our survey um, interview respondents. Um, really, when you consider the massive amounts of communication that have been happening, and I'm sure all of your organizations are experiencing this, I mean, it starts at a high level in terms of, well, how is our business going? What's happening, you know, what's happening to our ability to conduct business during the pandemic? But then really drilled down to other levels, we saw universally that there was specific um, communications uh, targeted to employees about their personal health, their mental health, financial health, and really companies really caring about that and spending the effort to make sure that their employees were taken care of. Um, one respondent said, look, there are really just no more excuses than that we cannot work remotely. Well, following on the heels of trust with psychological wellness, um, our studies uh, supported a lot of published research that surprisingly people crave personal connections. Okay, well, we got that. We didn't need to study. We didn't need a study to find that out. What we did find was interesting and a little bit more anecdotal. So certainly that first week, I'm not sure if you all experienced this, but you didn't really want to have your camera on, right? I mean, you were kind of slinking in the background, maybe, you, you know, hadn't completely gotten yourself together. But as time wore on, and I think we can, are finding more universally now, people do have their camera on. They are getting dressed. They are putting makeup on and combing their hair and shaving, well, shaving in most cases. Um, so we're really seeing Zoom as the main, or WebEx, or Slack, or Teams, or you know, you name your flavor of technology. But people are really proliferating, and you know, what started out as the Zoom meeting and then that you know Zoom cocktail hour has really blossomed into a bunch of different super creative ways that people are connecting. Um, one of our respondents was talking about. Um, the Microsoft Teams channels, I'm sure that you, many of you are familiar with that, and he said at his organization, the Stay Sane channel was the most important, had the most members, it was, you know, the, the most important to them. <clears throat> so, in our study, really, participants had really only been working from home for about three weeks, so I'm sure this is evolving over time, but we really were seeing, there was evidence of them sort of figuring it out. Initially, it's just sort of trying to figure it out on the fly and then figuring it out more purposefully, which really goes back to that desire, that human desire to, you know, be, be successful and do good at what they do. We heard just amazing stories about employees stepping up, working at the call center when that wasn't their regular job or helping out with curbside delivery. And, and then on a more personal level, really sort of reaching out to um, colleagues that they knew were perhaps sheltering in place alone or, um, and connecting with employees at greater levels than um, the, res the respondents had seen in, in the, the conventional situation and certainly greater response that they had seen if they're just walking from the office. Work-life balance for sure had a flip side. Um, there was um, this notion of, oh, great, I get to have lunch with my family. How cool is that? You know, the reality is respondents reported that more and more employees were logging back in at the end of the day after the kids perhaps had gone to bed. It was already set up. It was easy to do. And hopefully we're going to get some VPN uh, data that backs that up to try to understand really what are, how have people's work hours really been impacted by the work from home portion. Um, 
the this whole notion of drive to be good is really embedded in the human experience. Teams, of course, we're all working in teams. Um, many, many of our interviewees sort of really more uh, mourned the ability not to just stop into someone's workstation or to swing by someone's office. And, and this whole notion of having to be more intentional, I think folks are getting used to it now, but I think a lot of people still miss that um, in, um, serendipitous interactions. We also um, heard universally that teams were taking more risks and they were asking for forgiveness rather than permission, way more than folks saw in the office. Interesting. Um, in, in terms of team connectedness and organizational connectedness, boy, it's pretty hard not to feel connected to your CEO if they're broadcasting from their kitchen. There's a real personal side that was really revealed in, in our research. Um, people are really united. I mean, this is an important endeavor. It's an important experiment. It's important organizational and business survival. And, and it's really, it really translates at the most personal level to how people and their families are doing. There's a softer side, of course, not all work from home is that rosy. I mean, we, you know, remember when it was, when if the doorbell rang while you were on a conference call working from home or the dog barked, you'd like profusely apologize. Well, that's kind of not really happening anymore. I mean, people get it, right? Everyone no understands we're all in it together. The respondents universally talked about more empathy and uh, patience, surely than they express, than they see people expressing in the office. And there's a connectedness by having this shared experience. You get to see inside people's houses, you, and there's that level of bonding and cooperation um, that really has happened over this ex, over this work from home period. Okay, so the sixty-four thousand dollar question: Well, how is this going to translate into my real estate holdings? What am I going to have to do? What are you know? What are human? How are human behavior things going to be informing future corporate real estate decisions? So. Of course, our study respondents didn't have the answers, but I'll tell you, they universally had a couple perspectives, which I thought were valuable and I think still hold true, you know, six weeks after we conducted this research. Um, the savings and the change is going to be incremental. Um, it seems pretty dramatic that everyone's working from home now, but I think they all had a measured perspective that, yes, things are going to be different for sure, but it's, def it, it's, it's going to be incremental. Um, none of our respondents saw any portions of their workforce working from home 100% of the time. We've certainly read a lot about that in the press, but um, our, our select group of Fortune 500 thought that, yeah, for sure, people are going to be working from home, but not 100% of the time. The average was one to two days per week that they saw. Um, now, of course, not surprisingly, there is going to be a bump in the increase of real estate, at least if initially because of physical distancing, um, which could be potentially solved by, you know, split shifts or alternative days and things like that. So everyone acknowledged that the cuts in real estate are not going to happen instantly. Um, but again, universally, this whole notion of remote work strategies is going to really come into play, especially as leases start getting due and folks are really reassessing what is the purpose of my office space. Undeniably, this taste of freedom has really sort of is going to change. It's going to change the work, the employee workforce um, uh, taste and complexion. So let's get really get get back to employee experience, which is really where we started. So people have been given an extraordinary amount of control in how and when and where they work over these last eight weeks of working from home. I mean, we know research tells us we don't have to do this study that people. Um, people flourish more when they have more control over their workspace. Um, our group is planning on doing a phase two to really understand how, how to gain some insights when all this personal autonomy is brought back into the office and what kind of impacts that had. One of our respondents uh, said to us that they worked um, in the World Trade Center in 2001, and he said that after 9-11, it really became culturally acceptable in all the large banks in New York City to work from home. And he's speculating that COVID-19 will bring that same sentiment to the rest of the country. We all know that trust is really hard to gain and really easy to lose. Um, we also know that transparency is essential. Transparency really sort of makes and helps us build that trust. We've certainly got a long way to go to whatever that new normal is going to be. Um, and as many have talked about, 
the return to the office of course is going to be in phases and it's going to have varying impacts on various works course. So let's explore some of these implications. So um, our research and our team has um, put together a short, medium and long term uh, strategies for getting back to the office and what the office might want to look like. The, sh the short term version is essentially tactical. It's what you need to do, you know, in the next 60 days, 30 days uh, when your workforce starts returning. And there's four buckets that we we tend to see all of these things sort of falling onto. And, and um, as Mike is going to pre present um, in the second half of this webinar, sort of really more sort of hands on tactical things you can do tomorrow. This is a little bit more conceptualizing. So it's a little bit more of a uh, strategic high, high pie in the sky. Um, and I, again, I'm sure that you've seen all of these before in some fashion, but I'll just review some of the uh, some of the highlights of them, you know, this whole notion of everything being touchless, um, really increasing the interior air quality, interiors, everything from physical distancing to controlling um, travel paths and tons of uh, temporary signage. Uh, daytime cleaning like we've never seen before, um, you know, flexible work schedules, things like I've talked about. I think really the essential point and the wild card in all of this short term strategies to get folks back to work is really employee perception. Again, bringing it back to the people. Folks are anxious and uncertain and, uh, and trying to figure out when is it going to be safe for me to go return to the workplace? Is their employer or their landlord or their facilities team really doing all that they can to implement the highest and best practices. I had um, a reporter ask me the other day, well, you know, how much hand sanitizer is someone, is, does a company need to buy? And I said, as much as their employees think that they need. And so it's really that human perception that I think is really, is really gonna take the stream here. The midterm changes are things that are really sort of based on stuff that we're still learning, right? I don't really know that the midterm changes are completely going to are going to be completely evolving because I think we're still learning what we need to learn. Um, so of course, some of these overlap with the short term and some of these are being executed by companies right now. I think the common, um, the common thread on this is much of this technology already exists, right? We already have sit stands. Now, does everyone have a sit stand? I'm not sure. Um, the healthy material selections, again, really coming from healthcare. Many of the things that healthcare is doing now, you're going to start seeing bleeding into the office. And then the long term are really more um, science evidence based emerging trends. These are things that only um, are sort of on the cusp of being possible. I mean, certainly we have biometric security entry systems are starting to happen at, in some new buildings. Um, uh, integrating badge and health scans also we're starting to we're starting to see that but I'd like to use that analogy of the ADA. Remember in, when the ADA was coming into, in, in, into common practice in the 1990s? We all thought, wow, this is another whole set of um, uh, regulations and, and codes and things that we need to take into, um, take into consideration. And then after a while, it just kind of became common, common you know, second nature. And I really think the same, that we're going to see the same in these various policies. Well, um, I guess if there was one thing you're going to take away from this presentation and, you know, of everything that I said, I think the four things that I listed on this slide are sort of the things, no matter how you're going to be proceeding, are, are things to, to keep in mind with, you know, obviously it's not one size fits all. It's going to vary with the organization and with the culture and with the region and all that stuff. But I think it's fair to say that off all your decisions are based on your employee experience, human centered I think you're going to be in a good, like you're a, a good place to start. This stuff is complicated. I mean, I, 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 you've probably been uh, hit with the proliferation of guides and checklists and all that stuff to figure out this. Um, you know, simple and practical is probably the place to start, although not all of it is going to be simple and practical, but sort of continue to challenge yourself. Um, I think we also want to make sure that we understand that the first idea might not necessarily work and give yourself and level set with your um, with your stakeholders that we're going to tie this out. We're going to pilot this and maybe it's going to work and maybe we're going to get some feedback to find out that we're going to go to a plan B. And then there are a number of short term decisions that everyone's going to be making right now. And if you can make those short term decisions in a long term view, that will that will certainly help us.
Okay, here's my last slide. You know, I don't have the crystal ball and Eric and, and I talked a lot about, well, what do we have to look for for the future? What, is that, what does that really wanna look like? And while I would like to suggest that these nine categories are sort of where, where we might start to go, I think the roadmap is really, is yet, is really yet to be completely, completely determined. Um, I'll go over these quickly. Uh, Workplace assessment, right? we have a lot of data right now, quantitative and qualitative. I think we're gonna continue to see data driving decisions in workplace in ways that it hasn't been before. I also believe the communication level, the, um, is the integral organizational communication is going to continue um, even post COVID. Training is gonna become digital. I think the training, um, the training community has lo a long time been working towards this online. And I think the last um, two months have shown that training can be conducted digitally. Regarding safety, unfortunately, a lot of stuff that we've read has shown that this, um, the science is predicting that epidemics and pandemics are not gonna be over after this one. And that we are gonna wanna be integrating uh, screening and badge health as much as we can. Um, workplace guidelines, I mean, certainly um, the idea of uh, remote work is going to continue. That's going to be built into people's organizational strategies. Um, I think the pendulum is definitely going to swing back to the densification of workstations that we've seen lately. Food, boy, I think everyone pretty much knows that uh, in the great research done by Leesman, the Leesman Index has shown that food and drink matter in the workplace. There's, um, and I think the f nature of food outlets is going to dramatically change in terms of um, local is going to be important, but packaged is also going to be important. Um, housekeeping will continue to be visible and, um, and there will be some sort of certifiable cleaning protocols. Engineering and operations, um, having some kind of guaranteed interior air quality standards will be um, essential. Technology is going to be more than communication tools. I mean, technology is going to be really be integrated in every one of these uh, future, um, future strategies. And then last and probably most important is the health and well-being, the physical health associated with engineering materials that really allow cleaning and sanitation and corporate social responsibility. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Um, if you could please exit your share. Uh, all right. So thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, uh, just a reminder, if members of our audience today have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer some questions at the end of both presentations. Uh, for our second presentation, as Cynthia mentioned, we're gonna switch from a strategic to a more tactical view of reopening our spaces. I'd like to introduce Mike Hamill, uh, an environmental senior project manager with ECS Mid-Atlantic. Uh, Michael manages a team of staff and field industrial hygiene specialist in the DC metropolitan area. He is accredited uh, by the American Board of Industrial Hygiene as a comprehensive practice certified industrial hygienist. ECS Mid-Atlantic is a premier provider of geotechnical, construction material, environmental consulting, and facilities engineering services. His company operates in more than 65 locations throughout the United States which, with over 2,000 staff. So I now turn it over to uh, Michael. Thank you, Eric. Hello, everyone. Let's see if I can get this switched over here. Uh, so as Eric mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how to go about setting uh, plan for reoccupying your building tomorrow or next week. Uh, it's important to bear in mind that a lot of the information is still being developed and research is still being pended. So some of the stuff that I'm presenting today is will be changed as of next week. 
So I know that everyone's probably reached total sensory overload with COVID information and COVID-19 information. I think it's important though to go over the topics, uh, the basic information regarding COVID-19. So as decision makers, when you have employees or tenants come back into your buildings and they come with questions, you, you have the background to be able to answer and field those questions. So there is a great diagram on the side that talks about vi virus transmission, which pretty much says it all. You have an infected person who is shedding tens of thousands of viruses all the time while they're transmissible. A lot of those, that transmission happens in respiratory droplets, uh, which are your sneezes, your cough. Some of it also happens when you're talking and breathing. Uh, you have indirect and direct contacts Basically, there's a lots of modes of transmissions for these viruses. So one of the reasons that uh, this COVID-19 is so difficult is because the, I, I pulled a number of facts, which is why uh, this virus is so perva pervasive throughout our society. So uh, there's a study out from the uh, University of Hong Kong School of Public Health that uh, people are infectious on average two days before the onset of symptoms. Uh, about 44% of uh, symptoms happen before people are symptomatic. That's from the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, there's a combination of studies from Europe and the US that says about anywhere from 17 to 15% of people are asymptomatic. I bring these up. Uh, this is some of the most current information out there. I bring these up because you need to think about you're going to have employees or tenants who are likely going to come with their own list of facts. And as we develop protocols and systems for how to reoccupate, reoccupy buildings and workplaces, we need to understand and address um, our employees' concerns and the information that's out there. Uh, one of the, an example of this is I was watching the news the other day and they were quoting a study uh, talking about how greater than 50% of people were asymptomatic, which was really misleading because the study was based on 76 individuals in a retirement community in Seattle. So 76 is a incredibly small sample size and a retirement community is not representative of the U.S. as a whole. It's certainly not representative of workplaces as a whole. So those are some of the things you need to take into account when addressing some of the information that people bring about policies and plans for reoccupying the workspace. I know that facial coverings is a hot topic, uh, so I wanted to give a brief minute to talk about some of the difference between facial coverings. I'm going to go over um, the approved facial coverings or uh, facial coverings that are certified and inspected. And you can extrapolate that out to a scarf or a bandana. So the main difference between a N95 respirator and a surgical mask is with a N95 respirator, they are a tight fitting respirator that generally need to be fit tested before they're worn. If an employer requires employees to wear uh, N95 respirators, they have to be part of a respiratory protection program. And N95 respirators are designed to block out 95% of the smaller particles that you may breathe in. A surgical mask is different. Um, it is certified and inspected by the FDA, the US Food and Drug Administration. You don't need to have a respiratory protection plan to require workers to wear it. It's a loose fitting garment that is designed to stop lots of fluids either from leaving the wearer or entering the wearer. Again, it's important to remember that it's designed to stop lots the majority of fluids, what it doesn't do is it doesn't prevent virus transmission. So yes, you will stop a larger amount of droplets, respiratory droplets, but you still will be susceptible to breathing in respiratory droplets. I'm sure everyone's gone to the grocery store 
and we went from six feet distant to now you have people wearing scarves and all of a sudden it's six inches difference. Those are some of the things you want to take into account when you're developing these policies for your workspace. Um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about the current federal guidelines that are out there in terms of reoccupying the workspace. Bear in mind that these, uh, these guidelines are for federal workplaces. Your individual guidance from your state may be different, so you have to take that into account when creating your plan. So OSHA created a guidance document about preparing workplaces for COVID-19. They focused on a number of different elements. They talked about what are your potential sources for the virus? Um, is that your employees? Is that visitors to the building? Is that delivery and drop off? They talk about high risk individuals, people who travel a lot, uh, they're more susceptible to contract the virus. Uh, people who've been to areas that are hot spots or outbreak zones, non-occupational work uh, risk factors. If you have a family member who's sick, if you live with a healthcare provider, those are all risk factors. They also talk about uh, work site, flexible work sites, which I'm sure everyone in this call is very familiar with, having your workers work from home. They also mention uh, flexible work hours, which is the idea of having multiple different shifts to try and limit occupancy in your buildings to reduce virus transmission. Uh, a little later on in the slides, I'm going to talk about work families, which sort of expands on that idea. Another one of their uh, call outs in this document was to discourage the use of communal supplies, furniture, stuff like that. They identified response actions, which needs to be part, everyone needs to think about how they're going to respond if they have a positive case in their office, in their building, in their workplace. Um, talks about identifying. How to identify individuals, identify who they've had contact with, and try and isolate those individual, that individual or individuals to try and prevent the transmission to other, uh, other members of your team. Part of that response action is to educate your employees on how to identify the symptoms and what to do if they have the symptoms, which generally should probably be stay home if you're symptomatic. Uh, they also talk about some increased engineering controls for workers who are in high close contacts. Those are your front desk workers, your security guards, putting up uh, screens, uh, partition screening between your lobby staff and visitors to try and, again, reduce that virus transmission. So OSHA put out guidelines. The CDC and EPA also put out guidelines for cleaning and disinfecting buildings uh, during this reoccupancy phase. They broke their guidance up into a couple different parts. Um, areas which are unoccupied for more than seven days, their guidance was if an area hasn't been occupied for more than seven days, uh, no additional cleaning measures need to be implemented. So just regular cleaning. For outdoor areas, it was the same guidance with the exception of high touch surfaces, your door handles, your stair railings uh, should be disinfected. Areas that have been unoccupied uh, for less than seven days, they recommend uh, a bunch of additional cleaning measures that we're going to get into a little later. It's important to note that they mentioned this at the front of their guidance document that these are not a substitute for the other re existing recommendations like social distancing, hand washing, uh, facial covering policies, or sick policies. That needs to be taken into account when you disseminate this information to your teams. 
So what they offered in terms of spaces that haven't been occupied, that have been unoccupied for less than seven days, are you should first clean, then dis disinfect high touch surfaces. Uh, cleaning is washing with soap and water, your normal cleaning process. Disinfectants are obviously there is, they are designed to kill 99% of germs on a surface. The EPA has a list of uh, disinfectants that they have approved for use in treating uh, potential COVID-19 surfaces. It's important to remember that these disinfectants are much more potent than your normal cleaning uh, substances. There has been a increase in poisonings throughout the country as people try and use disinfectants, uh, not in the way the manufacturer recommends. Uh, so when you're implementing these additional cleaning policies, you need to think about is additional PPE necessary? Is the uh, product being used in accordance with manufacturer guidelines? And are we allowing enough time between when the product was applied and when we're having people reoccupy the space to make sure that uh, they won't get sick from this disinfectant? The CDC's guideline for this is regular cleaning for normal spaces and then cleaning and disinfection of high contact surfaces. So now I'm going to try and talk a little bit about how we take all those fed, federal guidelines and we boil them down and we uh, cater them to individual workspaces. Bear in mind that everyone has a different workplace, different set of challenges and employees that they have to deal with. So each of these policies is going to be fairly unique to the workspace that you operate in. Um, on your right here is what's called the hierarchy of controls. Um, bear, uh, the thing to notice is the most effective uh, principles are at the top, the least effective are at the bottom. PPE is down there at the bottom. PPE is generally a last line of defense and that is something to take into account when creating policies for your workspace. So some engineering controls in these are controls that uh, we have either helped implement or we have seen implemented from everywhere from construction sites to hospital settings. Um, temperature controls is a great one of where before people enter the site, the workspace, there can be remote temperature checks. Controlling access, which goes hands in hand with these temperature checks have a single point of entry and a single point of exit uh, so you can control who's coming and leaving the workspace. Bear in mind that you're probably going to have to design different policies for your employees and visitors and that needs to be taken into account when talking about access to the workspace. There's also this concept of work families. Um, I worked with a group that they had a board meeting and a positive individual came and the board members all got infected and had to go into isolation, which caused a huge problem because their board was inaccessible for two weeks. So part of the strategy for controlling access is stratifying skill sets into different groups. So if one group gets sick, hopefully your organization will be robust enough to pick up the slack while those workers are out of the office. A couple other considerations, general office uh, layout, uh, unidirection travel, removing furniture, communal furniture that isn't needed. Uh, again, just to reduce the point at which this virus can be transmitted. Additional hand sanitation uh, stations, at the, at the entry and exit of your buildings, uh, partition screening, which we've talked about for your uh, front desk staff, your lobby staff. Here are, again, a list of some administrative controls that we've seen implemented uh, during this pandemic. Limiting occupancy, we talked about splitting shifts, uh, four corner distancing, doing questionnaires, 
identifying common use items, your, your coffee stands, your water coolers, um, and trying to remove those from the workspace. And then uh, making special consideration for your food service providers in terms of carry out only and making sure you're uh, adhering to state specific requirements. All right, thank you everyone. All right, thank you, Michael. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, if you have any questions, please use your Q&A feature uh, on your Zoom screen. So uh, we have a couple of questions that I'll post to our speakers that have been uh, posted. Uh, first question is to Cynthia uh, from one of our audience members. Uh, did I hear you correctly say that the pendulum will swing back to greater density? I'm wondering if I misheard and that you meant that the pendulum will swing back to less density. Yeah, yes and yes. Um, long term, the pendulum is going to swing back to less density. But initially, at the first, when we first are moving in, I think it's the, the difference between density and capacity, right? Every desk is not going to be occupied originally because of physical distancing. So when we first move in, you're, you're, you know, you'll have more desks than you will have people occupying them. I think long term, as you're as you're seeing, uh, you know, new offices being planned and current offices being reconfigured, there is going to be less density than what we have today. Okay. Uh, the next question is maybe for the both of you. Uh, many ideas seem to involve corporate type operations, but so many small businesses or shops have less than ten employees and even less cash flow after the closings and revenue loss from this crisis. How will they implement all these possibly costly measures? Mike, you wanna start with that? Sure. Um, I, I think Cynthia brought this up to begin with. Um, at the end of the day, you're going to have to be dynamic when responding to this and understanding what realistically you can implement in your workplace given your work constraint and your business model. There are a lot of sort of common sense and simple efforts in terms of social distancing um, that you can implement that are, are cost efficient ways to reduce risk. The only thing I would add to that is going back to that perception is reality and that whole transparency thing, right? If you're a, a small business of 10 people or 50 people, um, you know, everyone understands that, you know, you're, you're in this together, you're trying, you're, you know, you're, you're trying to make the best that you can for your organization. I think there's nothing wrong with sort of playing that out with, with your key stakeholders and saying, you know, here's what we have available to us. What is the most, you know, what do you see as the most important? Of course, you have to follow, you know, federal and state guidelines, but over and above that, what's the perception of is reality for your specific culture? All right, next question is for either speaker. Do you have any information on how employer liability might be affected by their planning and ability to provide a healthy and secure workplace? Yes. Um, OSHA has made COVID-19 a recordable incident, um, which means that you can file for workers' comp. Um, the total fallout of that decision is not totally comprehended at this point, uh, but that does have broad ramifications. Okay. Next question. Um, in China, employees are boxing lunches more frequently. Should we expect less demand for food service and cafeterias for an extended period? Should we expect to need shields for each individual person that was previously in an office cubicle? I'll, I'll start that and then Mike, you can, you can join in. So um, from the food delivery, I really see food as being more packaged. I think the, the idea of the self-serve cafeteria line is, is going to go away for a while. As a matter of fact, some of our corporate clients are even um, 
getting rid of self-serve coffee and having everything being served by someone. So, um, so agreed. I think the packaging that you see in China is, um, it's already here and I think you're going to see um, more, more prevalence of it. What was part two of that question, Eric? About um, should, pe should people be expected to wear uh, oh, this, or, or the screening around, yeah. about, around, Building around individual people. Well, I think, I think Mike is going to be able to answer that, that, you know, it might give you psychological, um, you know, you know, safety, but not real safety. I mean, could you weigh in on that one, Mike? Yeah, uh, like you said, that has to do more with perception as reality. And uh, again, when it comes to facial coverings, when it comes to what is implemented in your workplace, the scientific answer isn't always exactly what makes sense at your workspace. Um, I've seen that in public policy, and I think we're going to see that in the workplace as well. Um, maybe we'll take one or two more questions. Um, can you guys talk a minute? Can you guys take a minute to talk about uh, contact tracing in the in the workplace? Sure. Um, so uh, we have dealt with this um, a, a little bit. I, I think again. I didn't get to touch on this as much, uh, but I think it's important and it will be go important going forward to try and isolate movement throughout a building. So um, you're minimizing the traffic that goes throughout a building. So if you have a positive case, you can try and isolate the areas they've been or the people they've interacted with to um, trace down who had exposure. And obviously that can vary a lot depending on the size of your workforce and the area in which you operate out of. And um, so last question, I guess, is, is uh, to Cynthia. In the competition for the right talent and human resources, how do you think the next generation of job seekers will view uh, this issue as it impacts companies and their, and their workplaces? I think every generation is going to want choice. And I think the nature of, of that choice in work from home is one of the choices of the toolkit. So I don't believe that the next generation is going to be any different than the current generations in terms of having choice to figure out what makes most sense. And, and that's really going to be part of your, your employment package is the choice to work different places. I think the bigger question is really what's going to be the purpose of the office? How are we going to be using the office in the future? What is, um, you know, are we, are we coming to the office for different reasons than we come to the office today? And I think that younger generations have had a different experience with that, the notion of how they've gone to school and what they've used the library for and how they've sort of um, conducted conducted their education is way different than earlier generations. So I think there's going to, I think there's going to be a mix of things, but I think people are going to be re-examining why are we going in, why are we going into work? Okay, I think we'll have to leave it at that. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we've allotted uh, for today. Please join me in thanking our speakers, uh, Cynthia Miloda of Where Macomb. Thank you, Cynthia. And uh, Mike Hamill of ECS Mid-Atlantic. Thank you, Michael, for joining us today. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Nice to meet everyone. Um, to close, I wanted to share some pictures sent to me on my Twitter feed. These are pictures of life during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic of work and a football game. Uh, I guess that just assures me that we've gone through this and worse before. We've adapted and thrived and that we will undoubtedly continue to do so. Before we go, I'd like to announce that uh, we are now open for enrollment with our Master's in Real Estate Development Program for the 2020 school semester. Please go to realestate.gmu.edu. Please join the George Mason University School of Business with upcoming webinars, including one tomorrow on small business lending. We will email you a link to the recording and slides of the event. Please join future programs of the George Mason Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship. Thank you for joining us today for Return to the Office, the workforce-focused approach. If you have any comments on this program, please email me at rmarioj at gmu.edu. And uh, take care, everybody.